to Amanpour on PBS. Tonight, tough talk on Iran. The U.S. Secretary of State vows to crush the country unless it changes its behavior. But can the U.S. do that alone? Or is the region headed for another military confrontation? I'm joined by the former head of the National Security Agency, former head of the CIA, Michael Hayden, whose blistering new book, The Assault on Intelligence, takes a sobering view of the Trump presidency. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the program. I'm Christiana Manpour in London. The Trump administration has stepped up its attempt to strangle Iran, reimposing U.S. sanctions while holding out the offer of a new treaty and reestablishing diplomatic ties that were broken back in 1979. That would be in return for a list of tough new demands. In his first major speech, the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo today piled on the pressure, what he called Tehran's malign behaviors. Two weeks after pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal, Secretary Pompeo said that Iran could only get sanctions relief again if it agrees to 12 more demands, including pulling its forces out of Syria, ending support for rebels in Yemen, halting development of ballistic missiles, and zero uranium enrichment. Within hours, the Iranian president fired back, saying no one would accept the United States deciding on behalf of the whole world. Indeed, the U.S. wants the backing of its European allies, but Pompeo seems to acknowledge that will be tough. We understand that our reimposition of sanctions and the coming pressure campaign on the Iranian regime will pose financial and economic difficulties for a number of our friends. I know that they may decide to try and keep their old nuclear deal going with Tehran. That is certainly their decision to make. They know where we stand. The EU is working hard to try to protect European firms doing business in Iran under the terms of that deal. This was European Council President Donald Tusk last week. We are witnessing today a new phenomenon. The capricious assertiveness of the American administration. Looking at the latest decisions of President Trump, someone could even think with friends like that who needs enemies. Tough words, and here now to help us through all of this, the former director of the CIA and NSA, Michael Hayden. His new book is The Assault on Intelligence, and he joins me now from Washington. General Hayden, welcome back to our program. Thank you. So, you heard uh, Secretary Pompeo, um, you know, Iran has been complying with that deal. Do you see a strategy in the U.S. position right now, an actual strategy? Well, I'm beginning to see the outlines of Plan B. Now, look, when we started it, the Iran nuclear deal, Plan A, I, I, I had my complaints. Uh, but after it was put in place, my view, and frankly, Christian, of American intelligence was that Iran was further away from a weapon with the with the agreement, we knew more about the program with the agreement, and as you said, Iran wasn't cheating. But we ripped up Plan A, and now I've been waiting for Plan B. We've begun to get the outlines of Plan B with clearly what was a set of maximalist demands, uh, including just about everything we think the Iranians are doing in with the nuclear portfolio as well. And so I, I just don't know whether we could achieve those with Iran still being Iran and perhaps the hidden meaning, that's the hidden meaning of the Secretary's speech. So the hidden meaning, if I can read through your lines, is that this is an attempt that Plan B is to break Iran uh, one way or the other, thinking that they can do that, or potentially a sort of a military Plan B. Well, I, I hope it doesn't come to a military Plan B and the Secretary didn't suggest that except if the Iranians try to break out and move in the direction of a weapon. What he wants to do is impose crushing economic sanctions on Iran, and, and therein lies the problem. We've got the goals, Christian, for Plan B. Now the means, the means would be sanctions, but they have to be more or less universal sanctions. We had that to get the original deal. I think it's going to be very difficult for us to get that with regard to this deal, not only because of the economic interests of our particularly European friends, but I don't know that they buy into our ultimate maximalist objectives. And, and just to be clear, 
Uh, you recall the original when Obama and even before him started to ramp up the pressure on Iran. Those were the maximalist global sanctions, including right. China, Russia, Europe. I mean, everybody was involved. I mean, how much more maximalist can you get? Well, uh, again, I think he wants to return to those those kinds of crushing sanctions, which did get the, the Iranians uh, to, to the table. But I, I just think it's going to be, look, the Obama administration got to that by narrowing its front and putting all international energy in a commonly agreed objective, which was the Iranian nuclear program. Now we are widening our front with regard to our objectives, and now we're expecting to get as much allied and international support. Again, I'm beginning to see the outlines of the plan, but this is a really heavy lift. And Chris John, what we may have done is further destabilize the situation in the Persian Gulf, setting in motion events that might be hard to predict, let alone control. And General Hayden, setting in motion also what looks to be a confrontation with its closest allies, the Europeans, this threat of secondary you know, sanctions on European businesses, who may continue to try to do business, Europe trying to go around the sort of existing methods and loopholes they can use to refuse to comply with U.S. sanctions. It just looks like he's also, President Trump, picking a fight with his closest allies when he needs them the most if he is to put these sanctions regime back again. I, I, I think that's, that's absolutely correct. And for Plan A, we got political agreement on the sanctions from our European allies. I think it was very clear what Secretary Pompeo said this morning here in Washington is that we are going to coerce our European allies simply by denying companies access to the American economy. That may be transactionally success, successful in the short term, but relationally, I, I think it would be very, very harmful for the transatlantic relationships. Can I just ask you before I go on to this new relationship, what would a military confrontation with Iran look like for the United States, the region, the world? Um, boy, that's, that's a very open-ended question. Now look, I, I am very much in support about against the Iranians, pushing back against the Iranians for what they're doing in Iraq, in Syria, uh, with regard to Hezbollah, in Yemen. And so I can see using American power and influence and resources there to push what really is Iranian ascendance in, in all of those regions backward. I get that. But when it came in the Bush administration, which is a bit dated now, Christian, but in the Bush administration, there were no easy answers with regard to a military confrontation uh, with regard to Iran, even on the narrowly focused nuclear question. Bob Gates, former Secretary of Defense, used to say a preemptive strike against the Iranian nuclear program will guarantee that which we're trying to prevent, an Iran that will stop at nothing to get a nuclear weapon. Can I move on to, uh, to your new book and, and the whole idea of reinforcing American intelligence, American democracy? Uh, and I just want to, you know, your, your book focuses on the disdain for the truth and for uh, doing uh, what, what, what it's doing to intelligence. Um, I wonder whether you noticed what the former Secretary of State said about this very issue uh, during a commencement speech last week. Let's listen. If our leaders seek to conceal the truth, or we as people become accepting of alternative realities that are no longer grounded in facts, then we as American citizens are on a pathway to relinquishing our freedom. When we as people, the free people, go wobbly on the truth, even on what may seem the most trivial of matters, we go wobbly on America. So Secretary Tillerson is just one of a number of prominent people using this theme right now. And it is the theme of your book as well. I'll, I'll, I'll read a, a quote in a moment. But what do you think of what he said? You know, Chris John, when I, when I heard it, I, I had the thought that that's a better summary of the book than I have been given <laughs> in, in, my, in my book tour. It, it is exactly the heart of the book. We, now, look, to be fair... We, the, the big we, I think British and American society, a bit in a post-truth era, post-truth defined as decisions based on less on evidence and, and data, more on preference, emotion, feeling, loyalty, tribe, and grievance, 
And that creates great stress, Christian, which you must be feeling as well for fact-based institutions like intelligence, law enforcement, and journalism. Where do they go in the national discussion if we aren't using facts as the basis for our decisions? Yes, we, we certainly all do feel it, and it's a big battle to keep that ship of facts you know, on the straight and narrow. And I want to read from what you wrote recently in the, in the New York Times about this. We in the intelligence world have dealt with obstinate and argumentative presidents throughout the years, but we have never served a president for whom ground truth really doesn't matter. There, these are truly uncharted waters for the country. We have in the past argued over the values to be applied to objective reality, or occasionally over what constituted objective reality, but never the existence or relevance of, objectively re of objective reality itself. What has this done to the intelligence community? Well, it, it's, it's given it an additional burden. And look, uh, all presidents are different. We, in intelligence, have to accommodate to the president or the or the prime minister, all right? We have to learn how he learns, present things in his way, um, follow his priorities. But we always were talking with someone who seemed to be departing from a view of objective reality, and I don't think that's a common case often in this administration. A very quick example, Christian, I relate in the book where an American newsman is pressing the president on why he believes Barack Obama wiretapped Trump Tower. Evidence, Mr. President, facts, evidence. The president got very irritated and responded, a lot of people agree with me, people were saying, a lot of people were saying. In, in other words, if I can make it popular or trending, it's real and I can use it as a basis for my action. That's, that's the tension that I try to describe, Christian. And certainly it must worry you. It certainly worries me as a journalist, and it has to worry just about everybody, that some of that spirit was around during the George W. Bush presidency, where they, you know, they, they had their own facts about intelligence and the rest, and there was a war that happened because of that, the Iraq War. And we're still reaping the terrible backlash and the blowback from that. Why are memories so short? Well, again, I was in the Bush administration, and, and for the one question with regards to weapons of mass destruction, let me throw myself on the mercy of the court. I was part of the team that strongly believed and advised the president that, that Iraq had that. But that was, turns out, to have been based on information that was simply not true. Now, if you're basing decisions, as I fear we often do today, without even a reference to that which might be objectively true, you simply increase your odds of, of actually heading in, in the wrong direction almost astronomically. Michael Hayden, thank you so much. Your book comes at a very, very timely moment. Thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you.